<laughs> no. All right. Oh, yeah, I see it. Cool. That's now recording. Perfect. All right, I'll do the Actually, it was made for me by a friend in Africa when I was like an African friend in North Africa when I was there. It's like, <laughs> anyway, um, also it's like so. so okay, so um, <laughs> welcome everyone to another exciting RAM talk. Um, here we have Mr. Fogel, James Fogel, who is the president of the Secular Society at Monash University. Today, talking Melbourne about, University. Oh, Melbourne. Don't get that wrong. <laughs> um, and, uh, and his talk is about dealing with disagreement. Um, just background, um, James is currently pursuing a Bachelor of Science at Melbourne Uni. Uh, he's, as I said, the president of the Secular Club there, um, and he's interested in religious dialogue, secular activism, and effective non-religious as he was interested specifically today. So I'll bring us his talk on dealing with disagreement. So give it up for our uh, James. <laughs> Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about the subject of peer disagreement, something that is quite uh, dear to my heart because I think it's very important and very uh, neglected in, in terms of uh, how much people talk about it. So just, um, just a warning, my aim for this talk is that it will be disturbing. So if it's not disturbing, if it doesn't bother you in some deep sense, then either you didn't understand it or maybe I'm just completely wrong. Um, or ma maybe those aren't mutually exclusive, but um, anyway, so... <laughs> Hopefully, um, you'll get something out of this. Now, I've said that I'm going to be talking about peer disagreement. We, we, we need a definition here so that you, um, we're all on the same page. So, disagreement just means you have different opinions. Disagreement's very common. It's also not very interesting um, because, you know, the fact that most people don't believe in, I don't know, climate change or evolution or whatever isn't that interesting because most people don't know anything about it. What's more interesting is peer disagreement. So, peer disagreement is, <coughs> I'm going to define as disagreement between um, what I'm going to call epistemic peers. So this is people who have roughly, are of roughly equal intelligence, um, equally well-informed, rational, honest, uh, unbiased, etc. Now, obviously, we're never going to have two people who are exactly equally, um, equally aligned on all of these things, but we'll say close enough, um, we'll call them epistemic peers. So that's the basic idea of what uh, we're talking about, peer disagreement. Disagreement between people who are well-informed about things. So this is a disagreement between two scientists or two philosophers in a particular field. <coughs> So just some quick examples. So um, these two people here, Richard Dawkins and oh, I forgot this gentleman's name, Francis Collins. These are both eminent biologists. They very much disagree about uh, religion. So this, this gentleman here is a Christian, and the relationship between evolution and what it says about uh, you know religious claims and Christianity, things like that. So that is an example I'm saying of peer disagreement. Another example of peer disagreement here is uh, Paul Krugman and Milton Friedman. Well, Milton Friedman is no longer alive, but Still, their ideas very much class. They're both economists, um, left-leaning and sort of more, more uh, libertarian-leaning. Again, another example of peer disagreement. Now, this is an example of what I would not call peer disagreement. Anyone care to tell me who the gentleman on the right is? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, creationist, uh, not an epistemic peer of Charles Darwin. So, one, I would say, knows what he's talking about. The other one has no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> so, hopefully, we have some notion of what I mean by peer disagreement <coughs> and what's not peer disagreement. So, I'm not talking about this sort of disagreement here. That's not very interesting. <clears throat> okay, so the core problem. Well, the core problem is, on lots of things that are important, there's a lot of peer disagreement, as this cartoon illustrates. We seem to, it seems very easy to find people who are just wrong about everything. <laughs> and of course, everyone thinks the other person's wrong about everything. So, like, what do we do with that? Now, that's what I'm going to be addressing in this, in this talk today. But just to so set the stage a bit, what are some examples of things where, where there's peer disagreement? Because this might sound sort of very abstract and philosophical, but I think that it's actually... Um, it has a lot of applications. So here are some, oh yes, some uh, some jargon. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to define P. If you've done some philosophy, this will be sort of familiar. P is just going to be a proposition. It's an arbitrary proposition, so some statement uh, which is controversial among uh, respected ex experts. So P could be any of these things, or like a million other things. Um, God exists. Objective morality is real. A priori knowledge knowledge is possible. That's a philosophical issue. Uh, fiscal stimulus is effective. That's an economic question. String theory, that's a physics question. So, all sorts of questions in politics, in science, in philosophy, in religion, all of these sorts of issues. <coughs> Anything like that where there's a lot of disagreement between experts, I'm going to say that that, that counts as key. That's a, a proposition from our, from our perspective. So, I'm not going to be looking at any one of these in particular. Uh, I'm just putting them as examples to help set the picture of what I'm talking about. Okay, so with that, now one more sort of technical distinction. 
which may be slightly confusing, but hopefully, hopefully I can articulate it well enough. In this talk, I'm going to make a distinction between an opinion and a belief. Now, these might sound like they're the same thing, and I'm not, I'm not claiming that there's some sort of deep philosophical distinction here that we can clearly demarcate. I'm just, I'm just using these terms differently for the purposes of this talk, because I think it's a useful distinction. So, what I'm going to define as an opinion is one's considered view based on uh, the evidence. So you look at the evidence, the arguments, and you form a, an opinion, a view of, it's like your take on what the evidence seems to be. That's an opinion. A belief is your mental state of, of assenting to or not assenting to a proposition, like how likely you think it is. <clears throat> so to give an example here, um, if someone just accepts a religious belief, or really any belief, just uncritically, then they have a belief about that, but they haven't really formed an opinion on it. They haven't actually looked at anything and, and thought about it. Whereas uh, you might have an informed uh, skeptic who knows a lot about the subject, but doesn't really strongly believe anything in particular. So they don't really have much of a belief or a strong belief, but they will still have an opinion. They will still have a sense of what they think the, the evidence uh, indicates. So hopefully that's, that's somewhat, somewhat a clear distinction. And why I make that distinction will become more evident, hopefully, in the course of the talk. Okay, now this is uh, my argument uh, in, in one sentence. Essentially, don't believe your own opinion. So just to clarify that, I'm using the terms as I've defined them here. Don't treat your, um, your opinion, your take on the evidence, as being indicative of how likely you think a proposition should be, should, should be true. So don't jump from opinion to belief. That's essentially what I'm arguing in this talk. Now, obviously I need to articulate that and explain what I mean and why that's the case. So that's, that's what I'm going to try and do now. Okay, so, uh, hang on, let me just, right. So, I go out, I mean, I could be anyone, and I do some reading, thinking about a subject, a philosophical question, a scientific controversy, whatever. I go in and I read some stuff, I talk to some people, I do some thinking. On the basis of that, I form an opinion about P. Remember where P is our controversial proposition, whatever it is. I say, I think P is probably true. So that's my opinion, that's my informed, uh, informed look at the evidence. So here's the question. What is the epistemic value of that opinion or judgment? What value does it have? Should, should I now believe P because I formed an opinion? What, what does that tell me? What does this uh, opinion tell me about whether P is likely to be true or not? <clears throat> now, let me give two examples to hopefully illustrate the point I'm trying to get at here. Which still might be a little bit murky, but hopefully we'll get there. So, here's example one. Some undergrad whom I don't know at the University of Nova Sofia or anywhere, um, they've done a moderate, a moderate amount of reading about a subject and they've come to the conclusion that P is, is probably true. Therefore, it is rational for me to believe that P is probably true. So the claim here is this is a bad reason for believing that P is true. Just because some undergrad at some university somewhere, someone I don't know, but you know, let's say that I think they're, they're moderately intelligent, they're moderately well informed, but still, just some undergrad somewhere has done some reading on, on a very controversial proposition they think that it's true. That's, that's a pretty lousy reason for me to think that it's true, given that there's a lot of disagreement among experts about this. I think that should be fairly uncontroversial. Um, so some undergrad somewhere thinks something, that's not a good reason for me to believe. Um, okay, so now, the flip side. I have done a moderate amount of reading on the subject, blah, blah, blah. So you'll notice it's exactly the same, except I've changed the subject there. I've changed it from some undergrad somewhere to me. Now what I'm claiming is, Changing the subject does not change the degree of epistemic justification. If I wasn't justified in believing P here, I'm not justified in believing it here. The fact that the person who has done the reading has transformed from some other person to now me doesn't make any difference. That's what I'm claiming. You know, assuming that we're roughly equally well informed and so, so that we're rough epistemic peers. <coughs> Let me give you another example here. So, there's uh, this undergrad at the, uh, the University of Nova Sofia. It seems to them that they know what they're talking about um, regarding some proposition, and that they have cogent arguments for accepting P and, and rejecting um, not P. So, so again, this, this student at the Un University of Nova Sofia, seems like to them they know what they're talking about, seems like to them they have good reasons for, for accepting P. Therefore, I should believe that P is probably true. Now again, this is just a variant of the one I said before. I'm saying this is a pretty bad reason for believing, some guy at some university uh, has done some reading and he thinks he's got good arguments, therefore I should believe. No, that doesn't really follow. Again, I'm saying if I switch that from some undergrad at the University of Nova Sophia to me, it doesn't change anything. I'm saying it's still, it's, that's still not a very good reason for me to believe P, this controversial proposition. Again, because there's still a lot of uh, disagreement about, about the nature of the proposition. So what I'm trying to do here is, uh, is paint the intuition or uh, the, the idea that it doesn't matter who forms the opinion. What matter, it does matter 
how knowledgeable they are or how unbiased they are, but it doesn't matter whether they're you or someone else. That's, that's the key difference. So again, let me try and explicate this idea a little bit more. So here's, I think, coming back to this distinction between an opinion, considered view of the evidence, and belief, thinking that something is true or false. Um, here's what I think people sort of naively or traditionally think. Um, they, take their, they take the reason and the evidence about some, some proposition, some issue, then they make an informed opinion about it. So they look at the evidence and think about it, talk to people, and they form an opinion. And they go from that opinion to belief. Now, the, and the belief sort of reflects the opinion in a very direct way. It seems to me that the evidence points this way, therefore I think the evidence does point this way. So that's, I think, what most people do. Now, what I'm saying we should do, or you know, we should at least move more in this direction, is, uh, is, is what, what I have under my argument there. We, we take the reason and evidence, and we make an informed opinion. This diagram isn't that great, but hopefully it sort of illustrates the point. We make an informed opinion, so up to here it's still the same. But our informed opinion, maybe it's, it's this arrow here, is one of many equally informed opinions. So maybe we add in... So, so we consider our opinion, but then there's the opinion of the guy from the University of Nova Sophia and the opinion of some other guy and the opinion of some other person. Uh, assuming they're all epistemic peers, so we're not just talking about random people, but epistemic peers, we consider all these opinions of epistemic peers and use all of those to inform what our belief is. So the idea there is that we don't just take our own opinion and place that in a superior position. We don't assume that it's uh, more likely to be true just because it's ours. We treat it as one reading of the evidence among many and sort of try and weight these together to get to our belief. That's the basic idea. It's a different way of treating your own opinion. It treats it as one among many uh, ways of looking at the evidence to, um, to, to then try and arrive at a belief. And I'll take questions at the end if, if um, people have some, as I imagine you will. Okay, here's another way of saying this. Um, people often say they have a right to their own opinion, and of course you do in a sort of a political sense, but what I'm arguing is you don't have epistemic warrant to treat your own opinion as more significant than that of an equally informed, unbiased person, that is, over an epistemic peer. Okay, now, a lot of people are very reticent to accept this, and there are a number of reasons one can give as to why you might prefer your own opinion over, over someone else's. So why is your opinion special? Well, there are a number of reasons why it is special, but I think that none of these are very relevant. So none of them actually justify you believing your own opinion over someone else's. So what are some of these reasons that people give? Well, one of them is that you have uh, easier access to your own opinion. I can just sort of introspect and think, well, this is what my opinion is. I can't do that for the guy at the University of Nova Sophia. It's much harder for me to get access to his opinion. But it doesn't seem like that's a very good reason for thinking that my opinion is probably right, just because I have better access to it. At, at, least, at least to me, I, I don't... There's no obvious connection there as why access would relate to probability being true or, or accurate. Um, your own, number two, your own opinion generally seems more coherent. It fits together better than someone else's opinion. Um, this often happens sort of when you just can't see where someone's coming from or people are like talking past each other. Although I, I will note that it often seems a lot more coherent until you actually try to start explaining it to someone and then it begins to seem less coherent, <laughs> at least in my experience. Um, but, but again, this notion that it sort of seems more coherent to you in a sort of subjective way doesn't, doesn't seem necessarily to be a very good reason for thinking that it actually is more coherent or that it actually is more, more true or more accurate. Um, of course, your opinions are yours and they're not someone else's. Well, unless you think that you are epistemically privileged in some way, then I, I, I don't think that that's a good reason for thinking that your opinion is better than someone else's. If you have a PhD in the subject and the other person doesn't, then that might be a case for thinking that you're epistemically privileged. But then the question is irrelevant, because remember, I'm talking about peer disagreement, and the other person isn't your peer then. But if then another PhD comes into the room, then they are your epistemic peer, and then this issue becomes relevant again. Um, your views may seem to fit better within your overall worldview. That is, they're sort of more coherent with lots of other things you believe. A lot of um, uh, religious people tend to sort of say this. They say things about the, uh, their religion sort of fitting together everything that they see in the world uh, in, in a coherent sort of way that, that makes sense of things. Um, again, it's, it's, hard for, it's hard to say why that makes it a better reason for accepting your own opinion, given that, of course, everyone else thinks that of their own views as well. Um, and this, this last one here, which I, I want to touch on a little bit, let me, yeah, okay. So, our own opinions feel very subjectively persuasive to us. It seems like, you know, you look at some evidence and you see, wow, that's really compelling. There's a subjective qu quality to that where it's sort of hard to stop yourself from jumping to the conclusion, well, this is probably true, because his argument just seems so right. Um, what, I, what I'm arguing is that that's not very reliable. In fact, we know that's not very reliable, as I'll, um, I'll point out later in the next couple of slides. But um, I think we have to be very careful here about distinguishing between a subjective sense of persuasiveness 
and actual epistemic reliability, or probably true or, or likely to, um, to be accurate. So, in sum, what I'm trying to argue in this slide is that essentially all the reasons that people, or at least most of the reasons that people tend to give as to why they should privilege their own opinion and trust that over that of epistemic theorists are not very relevant. They might be relevant, like, psychologically, but they're not relevant in an epistemic sense, like if you're trying to have accurate beliefs or true beliefs about, about the way the world is. So, so that's what I'm arguing there. Now, um, uh, on this point about persuasiveness and, and beliefs not being very reliable, there's just, I mean, there's an awful lot to say about this, and I think you've had some talk about this in the past, so just a couple of uh, brief points. And don't worry, this is not intended to be read. This is more of a rhetorical point. What this, actually, what this mess actually is, is a very far zoomed out picture of a uh, screenshot of pretty much all of the cognitive biases from the, wisp, the list on Wikipedia. Um, I don't know how many there are there, but there are an awful lot. The point is, well, not many, not all, but most of these have a great deal of psychological research about them and, you know, lots of papers about them. The point is there's an awful lot, and each one of these is a reason to be less confident in your own opinion, and there's like a bazillion. So um, I'm sort of just making a rhetorical point there as opinions are pretty unreliable, as, as we <coughs> from psychology. Um, and here's, here's some more evidence that should make us sort of, um, sort of skeptical. Here's just a very brief list that I, that I um, put together of very well-educated people, many of them PhDs, who believe just totally nutty things. Um, so <laughs> this gentleman at the top has a PhD in physics. He's a 9-11 conspiracy theorist. Uh, David Irving, some people may have heard of, a historian who denies that the Holocaust happened. Um, MD here, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, who believes in homeopathy. Linus Pauling, some people may have heard of this. He was a, a, actually a two-time Nobel Prize winner. Um, who then sort of went on advocating about vitamin megadosing and sort of, sort of went off on the, the strange track of alternative medicine. Um, a PhD in chemistry who believes in the expanding earth theory. Has anyone heard of that, by the way? Yeah, <laughs> it's a fun one. It's a fun one. Some people believe that the earth is expanding and that is what explains the, the um, change in the, the continents over time. Anyway, it's, it's, it's weird. Um, <laughs> reptilians. Um, I can't remember who this, I think a prominent journalist or something like that. Who, who's heard of reptilians? Yeah. 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 They're That's fun right. too. <laughs> David I think would be the very antithesis of a peer in these things. Just a crackpot person that lives at the end of the bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not yeah. saying that these pe people are peers to any particular person. I'm just yeah. saying that they're educated people. They're not. Um, they might be. Well, I think they are all whack jobs in in, in this sense. But um, yeah, not not unintelligent people. I think yeah, so certainly that, that's possible. Anyway, so that is just a broad illustration of certainly you can be well educated and have a completely ridiculous opinion. All right. So that is. Uh, the essential core argument that I want to make. Now, in the remaining time, what I want to do is address some common responses to uh, this line of argument that I make and illustrate why I think that they're, they're incomplete or they're, they're not that good responses, um, at least the direction I'll sort of go here. So one very common response uh, is that, well, we can't be certain before we, we, we form beliefs. We can't be certain about things. Um, this is sort of a misconstrual of what I'm actually arguing because what I'm arguing has nothing to do with certainty. It, it, and it's all about the correct level of confidence. I'm saying that we should be less confident about, about P, that controversial proposition, where there's a lot of P disagreement. It, it just doesn't really have anything to do with certainty. This could be saying that your probability, even if it's less than one, is still far too high, um, given how much disagreement there is. Um, so, yeah, regardless of whether we're certain or not, we, just, we don't want to be overconfident about, about our beliefs, and that's the, the fundamental point here. Uh, another response, which again just sort of seems to misconstrue the, what I'm arguing here, is that, well, the fact that people disagree with me doesn't mean that I'm wrong. Obviously that's true. It could be the case that you are right and other people are wrong. It could even be the case that you alone, of all people on the earth, are correct about some proposition and every single other person is wrong. It's possible. The point is, how plausible do we think that is? Or, to put it differently in the, in the form that I've uh, been stating my argument, why is your opinion more likely to be right than their opinion? And, and again, we looked at the reasons that we went through about why people tend to trust their own opinion, and I argued that they're not very good reasons. So the issue here is not saying that you must be wrong because someone disagrees with you. The issue is how can you maintain confidence, or why should you privilege your opinion over theirs? Okay, so uh, another response is that other people are biased. And um, people seem to like to raise this in particular about experts in some field that, that they don't like, like um, economists are all biased about this, or you know, physicists are all biased towards string theory, or things like that, or e evolutionists is another one that, that are raised. Um, but the trouble is that in order for this to be relevant, you have to have an argument as to why you, or maybe the you and the people who agree with you, are less biased than the people you disagree with. 
And I mean, there's this cartoon it illustrates that's that's a hard one to, to argue for. I think it's it's not impossible that you're left biased, but it's very difficult to be able to give a reason as to why how you know that's the case. You can't really introspect and say, well, it seems to me that I'm unbiased. That that's obviously a very bad way of telling if you're biased. <laughs> so so this argument is is I think very problematic. Um, it's it's very easy to say that others are biased that, that when you disagree with them. Much harder to see the bias in yourself. Ah, yes, a point here about, about having access to, to privileged information. So, some people will, will, will say essentially that, you know, well, I've read more about this, or I just know stuff that they don't, or I've heard this argument that they haven't, um, and, and therefore that's why I'm allowed to disagree with them, that's, that's where they're that's by disagreeing with them. There's a couple of points on this, and the first one is that sometimes you will have privileged access to information that other people don't have. So a classic example of this, of this is if the issue is anything to do with your personal life. Like, if someone were to argue with me about, I don't know, what cereal I like or something like that, <laughs> then I would say, no, I do have uh, superior privileged information uh, to you because it's a question about my own personal life. So sometimes you do have privileged information. Um, but a lot of the time, for a lot of the issues that we're talking about here, I don't think it's, it, it's, it's not very plausible to say that you have privileged information. Particularly because you might say, well, you know, I, I know I've read all these books, and I'm not really sure what books this other person's read. But again, it doesn't seem like there's any reason to suppose that just because you don't know about what the other person has read, that therefore they, they haven't read about that stuff. Again, if it's some random person off the street, you can probably infer that they haven't read that much about it. But if in general you, you know they're a well-informed, educated, uh, intelligent person who's interested in this issue, I, it doesn't seem like there's much justification for, for just assuming that because you've read a lot and that they've read less and therefore that you must have more information or, or privileged information. To put it differently, if you have access to privileged information, then how do you know that they don't have access to privileged information that you don't know about? Again, there doesn't seem to be any reason to just assume that that's not the case. So, um, more generally, it's just very, again, like the bias question, it's very hard to argue this, I think, that, that you, um, to, to make a clear case that you actually do have access to privileged information. One final point on this is that, that some issues where I think this gets confused, and I think particularly in regards to like experiences about the paranormal or religious experiences, um, or alternative medicine as well, people can get a bit confused here because if they say that I've had this particular experience of this medicine working for me, or this experience with the divine, or whatever, then they do have privileged access to privileged information about that particular experience, because they had it and you didn't. Um, there's not much to say about that. The, the trick is jumping from the, access, the privileged access to that particular experience to privileged access about the question in general. So, I think th th there is a, g a difference between having privileged access to, say, my personal experience of homeopathy, or, or whatever, and then going from that into saying, well, homeopathy works. Um, I mean, there's a lot more to unpick there about exactly how you, you draw that inferential difference, but I'm just sort of highlighting that as you may have privileged access to something, but that might not necessarily be the same thing as the actual question that, that you're um, debating. <laughs> okay, I listen to both sides. So this is what people tend to say. Well, yes, you're right. Of course, people disagree, and it's really hard to form an opinion. But what I do is I listen to both sides, I weigh up the evidence, and I determine who's probably right. I, I make an informed opinion. I try and weigh up the evidence of both sides. Um, well, I mean, the obvious problem here is that everyone says they do that, or at least most people say that they do that, and they still come to different conclusions. So why is it that your evaluation of both sides is superior to the other person's evaluation of both sides? Um, and I just love this as being a beautiful illustration of that, of how everyone thinks that they're, they're fair and balanced. So it's, it's problematic to, to, to use this as a reason for much of anything. Okay, so what are we going to do about this? I present that this is a pretty big problem, that uh, about lots of things in politics, in philosophy, in science, in religion, experts disagree about uh, things. And they disagree a lot, and I'm saying that we should not treat our own opinions as particularly special. We should try and sort of have a, a weighted average, in a sense, of, of expert opinion. And by the way, just parenthetically, I haven't really defined how that works. Maybe we can get to that in question time, but it's sort of like a peripheral issue, um, a little bit at least. So, but what should we do? Um, what should we do with it? Should we just have no beliefs about anything? That, that seems to be a bit extreme. Well, no, I don't think we think we should go that far, because there are still lots of things where there is expert agreement, or a fair bit of expert agreement. Um, Climate change is a good example of that. There are lots of things in sciences where there's, where there's a, a fair amount of agreement. Even many, many moral questions, there's a lot of agreement as well. Um, even if maybe people disagree on the sort of meta-ethical framework of things, there's still a fair amount of agreement that you know murder is wrong. Uh, so there are lots of things that we don't have to worry too much about peer disagreement because it's actually a fair bit of agreement. But I do argue that when experts do disagree, we should remain substantively agnostic about something or. Um, more to the point, we should try and align our own opinions with what the uh, balance of experts seem to be thinking. And again, maybe we can get into more detail about how that works later. 
Um, another important thing I think we should do is frequently engage in meta-reasoning. This is thinking about how we reason and how we, we come to conclusions about things. So if we're interested in finding out the answer to some philosophical question, we shouldn't just engage with the philosophical the literature about that question. We should do that. But we should then stop and think, well, how am I weighing up these different arguments? How am I actually coming to a conclusion here? And why should I think that my opinion is better than, than this other opinion? So we should try, we should do more meta-reasoning about how, reasoning about how we are reasoning. I think people don't necessarily do that very often. And maybe at, you know, at RAM, you do do that a lot more often than, than most people, so, so that's good. Um, but I think it's something that, that's important to do. Second last point here is, is don't make yourself into a world expert about something. I, th this is something I see far too often, and I still do sometimes. It's, it's all too tempting to, to just, you know, have a peripheral understanding of things, or maybe even a fairly good understanding of things, but, um, and, and then to make pronouncements about, well, this is the case, and, you know, I've looked at it, and this is, here's what the evidence says. Essentially, you're making yourself into the universal world expert. You're saying, well, yeah, I know that there are experts who think this and experts who think this, but here's how it is, because, you know, I'm the expert on things. People never explain it like that, but it's, it, it's hard to say when people are making pronouncements, uh, str like strongly claimed pronouncements about very controversial questions. I think it's hard to say how they're not making themselves into the universal world expert. Um, and like, you should not do that unless you actually are the world expert, and you're probably not, so <laughs> be careful about that. Um, final point is seek disconfirming evidence and viewpoints. So one of the biases that I mentioned earlier in that ridiculous list is, um, is confirmation bias. So we tend to seek out information that confirms what we already believe and ignore disconfirming evidence, and we tend to associate with people who already agree with what we say. Um, this makes it much harder to evaluate like, how many people actually share my uh, uh, evaluation of the evidence, or um, it makes it harder to do meta-reasoning, I think, and so that's why I think it's very important to actively seek out people with disconfirming evidence and viewpoints. Again, this applies to issues where there is peer disagreement. So I wouldn't say that you have to go and seek out people who, I don't know, believe in, in UFOs or a climate change deniers, because I don't think there's peer disagreement about those. But I would say you should seek out uh, disconfirming evidence and alternate viewpoints about many political questions and uh, religious questions, philosophical questions, because there is a lot of disagreement about those things. Okay, um, excellent, we're right on time. So if you're interested in more about this stuff, I'm just sort of gratuitously plugging my stuff here. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, I have a podcast, although I don't really talk about any of this, it's just a science podcast where I talk about you know, physics and chemistry and psychology and stuff. Although there are some episodes about cognitive psychology which are kind of relevant to what I'm talking about here. Um, but check that out if you're interested. The other thing is I have a blog. Um, it's called The Godless Theist. So you can <laughs> Google that or the address is, uh, where is it? Here, fosfol.wordpress.com. Uh, you can see a theme in these addresses here, perhaps. Um, yeah, so on this blog I talk about some of these issues. Like my first post series about peer disagreement where I, I talk about some of these similar issues. So check those out if you're interested. And at that point I think I'll stop, but hopefully there will be some you know, questions and further discussion we can have and people will sort of... Um, hammer me on some things, but, but yeah, we'll end the formal discussion there. So, thank you. Okay, so, who wants to go first? Yes. Could you just go back to slide for a bit? Okay, so we have seek disconfirming evidence and viewpoints. Okay, so let's just say, say, take something like, say, theism. Yeah. Right? Um, we have, we all form our opinions, which then inform our beliefs on this particular issue. Uh, but then how do you go about, say, finding a peer um, who's into, say, theism, and then how do you actually justify what they would consider as evidence from a viewpoint? So, so how do we find epistemic peers? Is that essentially... For, well, for things which we uh, which we definitely consider probably a little bit left field, such as like theism or polytheism or things like that. Could you say, like, because for instance we have different opinions on what constitutes evidence, yep. whereas yeah. in science there's very different, definite sort of reasons for what's an evidence yep. or an opinion, uh, whereas theism might take something that would not necessarily be closer to a belief, for instance. Yep, okay, so that question of how you identify an epistemic peer, particularly with questions like religion, uh, where there isn't, there's disagreement about even how you approach the question. I think a lot of philosophical questions like that as well. Basically, it's hard. <laughs> there's no, there's no easy answer to that. Um, I, I don't really know how you find a peer in some sort of specific sense. I don't have an algorithm for peer finding, um, <laughs> unfortunately. But I think we, 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 we can use certain heuristics. We can tell if someone, in talking with someone, hopefully, we can try and tell. Well, does this person have a familiarity with the type of debates? Do they, do they have a sense of what the questions are? Do they have a sense of what people have said about this? Um, if someone just doesn't seem to know anything about like the key vocab, the key debates, uh, the key ideas, then they're probably not a, a, an epistemic peer. Now, um, that's tricky because 
they might not buy into your um, your way of looking at things. Like they might have a different, a very different take on what counts as evidence and things like that. And I don't think you can you can dismiss that because that itself is a very difficult area to deal with. Like epistemology, how do you what counts as evidence? How do you know things? There's a lot of disagreement about that. But I, I do think that at least potentially you can try and, and make a distinction between someone who really knows their stuff but has a very different take on things than you do versus someone who just doesn't really know their stuff. And I'm not saying it's easy to do that, but like I guess that's something we should try to do. I'm not saying I have any easy answers to this sort of stuff or that there's a, there's a quick way of doing it or that I found out how to do it and I'm telling all you how to do it. No, I'm, I'm saying we should be we're concerned about this and try to uh, do, do it more. So does that sort of answer the question? Or like... Yeah. In a, well, it's, it doesn't really answer the question, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean. Yes? Um, this is not that important, but nervous of fear, did you just make that up? <laughs> is that just like new knowledge or something? Is, or yeah, is that I, actually universal? No, I, I made it up, um, because okay. I didn't want to, I didn't want to pick any particular example. Yeah, just mean like new wisdom or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you picked that up. But also, um, you were talking about um, bias. Yes. Um, and I've often had people say, oh, you're just biased against my conclusion, therefore, you're wrong, it's like, like you, that's why we disagree, because you're just biased against my, my conclusions, right? You're, you're just biased against the, you know, the supernaturalistic or theistic worldview, there we go. And so, but what I have found, or the views that I've developed, is that, like, for example, with, say, I don't know, um, climate change, for example, it, it doesn't really matter whether or not you're biased for or against, what matters is if the information is accurate. So it doesn't matter if I'm biased for evolution, the evidence overwhelmingly supports evolution. So the fact that I'm biased, doesn't change the fact that it's correct. So would you say that the accuracy of the information is more important than the bias, that the bias only helps to identify someone's errors, like why someone made an error, when it's found out that they're wrong? Like, does that make sense? What do you yeah, think I, think, I think I actually disagree, and here's, here's the mm -hmm. issue, because, hmm, I have to be careful here, <laughs> but a lot of things, on a lot of questions, it seems to be, the disagreement is not so much about factual information, at least the disagreement among people who know what they're talking about is not about factual information, it's about interpreting.